filming this video. It is Friday the 13th. So happy Friday the 13th to all my horror fans out there. I hope you guys are having a fantastic day. I know in the past I've made a lot of videos on Friday the 13th role-playing as Camp Counselor Chad. It reminds me of the good old times of when I first started uh, doing YouTube and I really enjoyed making these videos, but this year I thought we'd do something different and read some scary stories. Two years ago, I read the first book in my collection here of scary stories to tell in the dark. Today, we're going to finish the second book. It's going to be a nice long video, so sit back, relax, and in honor of Friday the 13th, I have a question for you all to answer down below in the comments. What is your favorite Friday the 13th movie in the entire Friday the 13th franchise? I'm going to answer with Friday the 13th Part 7. I love Friday the 13th Part 7. Uh, it's my favorite looking Jason, and I just really, really enjoy that movie. So that one's always been a favorite of mine in the series. You answer down below what your favorite one is. And as always, like the video to support the channel and subscribe. I would really appreciate it. So, as we get started in reading the second book in this franchise, we need some ambience, uh, so turn off your lights, lay down, go out in the creepy woods and hope Jason takes a visit to you, but we're gonna need some ambience as well. That sounds nice. I like that. Let's get started. scary stories to tell in the dark collected by Alvin Schwartz I'm going to be showing you all the illustrations in this book as well because I remember my family used to read this book to me when I was younger all the time and it scared the hell out of me so let's have some fun and get started with our First story. Something was wrong. One morning, John Sullivan found himself walking along a street downtown. He could not explain what he was doing there, or how he got there, or where he had been earlier. He didn't even know what time it was. He saw a woman walking around toward him and stopped her. I'm afraid I forgot my watch, he said and smiled. Can you tell me the time? When she saw him, she screamed and ran. Then John Sullivan noticed that other people were afraid of him. When they saw him coming, they flattened themselves against a building or ran across the street to stay out of his way. Sounds like me. There must be something wrong with me, John Sullivan thought. I'd better go home. He hailed a taxi, but the driver took one look at him and sped away. John Sullivan did not understand what was going on, and it scared him. Maybe somebody at home can come and get me, he thought. He found a telephone and called his wife, but a voice he did not recognize answered. Is Mrs. Sullivan there? He says. He asked. No. She's at a funeral. The voice said. Mr. Sullivan was killed yesterday in an accident downtown. Not gonna lie, I got a little bumps on me from that one. Got some chills. Uh, I very much like that one. It really makes you think about, you know, what happens after death? Is there a life after death? And are you aware of it? 
I'd like to come back and haunt some people. The next story we'll be reading is called The Wreck. And there's a uh, there's the photo there for you. I don't know how to read that name. That name Fred and who? Fred and Gian. Fred and Gian. <laughs> Fred and Gian went to the same high school, but they met for the first time at the Christmas dance. Fred had come by himself, and so had Gian. Soon, Fred decided that Gian was one of the nicest girls he had ever met. They danced together most of the evening. At eleven o'clock, Gian said, I have to leave now. Can you give me a ride? Sure, he said. I've got to go home, too. I accidentally drove my car into a tree on my way over here, Gian said. I guess I wasn't paying attention. Fred drove her to the head of Brady Road, and it was a neighborhood he didn't know very well. Why don't you drop me off here? Jeanne said. The road up ahead is in a really bad condition. I can walk from here. Fred stopped the car and held out some tinsel. Have some, he said. I got it at the dance. Thank you, she said. I'll put it in my hair. And she did. Would you like to go out sometime? To a movie or something? Fred asked. That would be fun, Jeanne said. After Fred drove off, he realized that he didn't know Jeanne's last name or her telephone number. I'll go back, he thought. The road can't be that bad. He drove slowly down Brady Road through a thick, oh, through a thick woods, but there wasn't a sign of Jeanne. As he came around a curve, he saw the wreckage of a car ahead. It had crashed into a tree and had caught fire. Smoke was still rising from it. As Fred made his way to the car, he could see someone trapped inside, crushed against the steering column. It was Jeanne. In her hair was the Christmas tinsel he had given her. Spooky. I got, I got some gooseys on that one as well. It's like, how did the tinsel get there? The next story we're going to be reading is One Sunday Morning. Did any of you read this growing up as well? I know a lot of my fans are young, but... I'm curious to see how many of you have read these stories as a kid, because I know they've been around for a very, very long time. One Sunday morning, Ida always went to the 7 o'clock Sunday morning service at her church. Usually, she heard the clanging of the church bells while she was eating breakfast, but this morning, she heard them while she was still in bed. That means I'm late. She thought. Ida jumped out of bed, quickly dressed, and left without eating or looking at the clock. It was still dark outside, but it usually was dark at this time of year. Ida was the only one on the street. The only sounds she heard were the clatter of her shoes on the pavement. <laughs> Everybody must already be in church, she thought. Ida took a shortcut through the cemetery. Then she quietly slipped into the church and found a seat. The service had already begun. When she caught her breath, Ida looked around. The church was filled with the people she had never seen before. But the woman next to her did look familiar. Ida smiled at her. It's Josephine Kerr, she thought. But she's dead. She died a month ago. Suddenly, Ida felt uneasy. She looked around again. As her eyes began to adjust to the dim light, Ida saw some skeletons in suits and dresses. 
This is a service for the dead, Ida thought. Everybody here is dead, except me. Ida noticed that some of them were staring at her. They looked angry, as if she had no business there. Josephine Kerr leaned towards her and whispered, Leave right after the benediction, if you care for your life. When the service came to an end, the minister gave his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you, he said. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. Ida grabbed her coat and walked quickly toward the door. When she heard footsteps behind her, she glanced back. <laughs> she glanced back. Several of the dead were coming toward her. Others were coming up to join them. The Lord lift up his countenance to you, the minister went on. Ida was so frightened she began to run. Out the door she ran with a pack of shrieking ghosts at her heels. Get out, one of them screamed. Another shouted, you don't belong here, and ripped her coat away. As Ida ran through the cemetery, a third grabbed a hat from her head. Don't come back, it screamed and shook its arm at her. By the time Ida reached the street, the sun was rising and the dead had disappeared. Did this really happen? Ida asked herself. Or I been, have I been dreaming? That afternoon, one of Ida's friends brought over her coat and hat, or what was left of them. They had been found in the cemetery, torn to shreds. That one was whatever. By the way, this first part is all about ghost stories, if you can't tell. <laughs> this next story is called Sound. Speaking of sounds, ambulance sounds on Friday the 13th. of horrible laughter filled the house. 
It went on and on until the fishermen thought they would go mad, when finally it stopped. The fishermen heard someone coming down the stairs, dragging something heavy that bumped on each step. <laughs> they heard him drag it through the front hall and out the front door. The door opened and it slammed shut again. Silence. Suddenly, a flash of lightning filled the house with a green blaze of light. A ghastly face stared at the fisherman from the hallway. Then came a crash of thunder. Terrified, they ran out into the storm. Spooky. Imagine sleeping over an abandoned house and hearing someone get murdered. I'm out of there. <laughs> the next story is a weird blue light. Late one night in October 1864, a Confederate blockade runner slipped by some Union gunboats. That's this right here. slipped by some Union gunboats at the entrance to Galveston Bay in Texas and made it safely to port with all of its cargo of food and other necessities. Louis Billings, the master of the small vessel, was getting ready to weigh anchor when he was startled by a shriek from one of the crew. A strange old-fashioned schooner with a big black flag was rushing down at us Billings said later. She was afire with a sort of weird pale blue light that lightened up to every nook and cranny of her. The crew was pulling at the ropes and doing other work, and they paid us no attention, didn't even glance our way. They all had ghastly bleeding wounds, but their faces and eyes were those of dead men. The man who had shrieked had fallen to his knees, his teeth chattering as he gasped out to prayer. Overcoming my own terror, that was a chillin', the very marrow of my bones. I rushed forward, shouting to the others as I ran. Suddenly, the schooner vanished before my eyes. Some say that it was the ghost of Jean Lafitte's pirate ship Pride that sank off Galveston Island in 1821. She was never seen again in 1892 in the same waters with the crew. I'm guessing that one was just a pirate ghost story of a couple of pirates who came across the Black Pearl. Or whichever one has the dead pirates on it. I don't watch Pirates of the Caribbean, I'm sorry. Next story is Somebody Fell from a Loft. I had signed on as an ordinary seaman, another sea story, on the falls of Ettrick, a merchant ship bound for England. But the first time I saw that ship, I knew her right away. She was the old Gertrude's Burshoe. I had sailed on her years before when she was painted brown and gold. Now she was painted black and had a new name, but it was the same ship for sure. We had a pretty good crew for that voyage, except for one hard-looking ticket named McLaren. He was a pretty good seaman, but there was something about him that I didn't trust. He was kind of secretive, kept mostly to himself. One day, somebody told him that I'd worked on the old Gertrude. For some reason, he got all a tremble over that. Then I catched him, giving me all of these ugly black looks, as if he was itching to knife me in the back. 
I guess it had something to do with the Gertrude, but I didn't know what. Well, this one day, we was trying to work our way through a dripping black fog. You'd scarcely know we had all the lights on, and it was dead calm. There wasn't a breath of fresh air. The ship just lay in there, wallowing in a trough, a rolling and a rolling, going nowheres. I was standing my watch around midships, and McLaren was doing his trick at the wheel. The rest of the crew was scattered around one place and another. It was quiet as can be. Then all at once, wacko! This thing hits the deck right in front of McLaren. He lets go a screech that turns my blood cold, and he falls down in a faint. The second mate starts yelling that somebody has fallen from aloft. Laying out there just forward of the wheel was someone or something dressed in oilskins with blood oozing from underneath. The captain ran and fetched a big light from his cabin so he could see who it was. They kind of straightened about to get a good look at his face. He was a big, ugly-looking devil, but nobody knew who he was or what he was doing up there. At least nobody was saying they did. When McLaren came to from his faint, they tried to get something out of him. All he did was jabber away and keep rolling those big, wild-looking eyes of his. <sighs> Everybody was getting more and more excited. We all wanted to heave the body overboard as quick as we could. There was something weird about it, as if it wasn't real. But the captain wasn't so sure about getting rid of it that way. Could it be a stowaway? He asked. But the ship was so filled with lumber we were carrying, there is no space wherein the living thing could hide for three weeks, which was how long we'd have been out. Even if it was a stowaway, what was it doing aloft on such a dirty day? There was no reason for anyone to be up there. There was nothing to see. Finally, the captain gave up and told us to heave him overboard. Then nobody would touch him. The mate ordered us to pick him up, but nobody made him move. He tried coaxing, but that didn't do any good. Suddenly, that loamy McLaren starts yelling. I handled him once, and I can handle him again. He picks up the body and staggers over to the railing with it. He is just about to throw it overboard when it wraps its two big, long arms around him, and over they go together. Then on the way down, one of them starts laughing in a horrible way. The mates are yelling to launch a boat, but nobody would get into the boat, not on a night like that. We threw a couple of life preservers after them, but everybody knew they wouldn't help. So that was that. Or was it? The first chance I had got home after that, I went right over to see old Captain Spurshoe, who was the captain when the Gertrude was around. Well, he says, one trip, those two outlandish men shipped aboard the Gertrude. One was McLaren, the other was a really big fella. The big one was always picking on McLaren and thumping him around, and McLaren was always talking about how he would get back at him. Well, this wet, dirty night, the two of them was up there alone, and the big one come flying down, killed himself deader than a herring. There's a little illustration for you to go about this story. McLaren says the foot rope they used were parted, and how he almost fell himself. But everybody who saw the rope knew she didn't give away on her own. She had been cut through with a knife. After that, whenever we came into port, McLaren thought we were going to get the police after him, and he'd get pretty scared. But we couldn't prove anything, so we didn't try. In the end, I guess the big fella took care of things as 
his own way. If he was a ghost that came back, that's what he was. If there be things like ghosts, that is. So McLaren murdered this guy back in the day. And this guy came back as a ghost and said, let me holla at you and just throw him overboard with him. The next story is Little Black Dog. Picture reminds me of my dog, Happy. The Little Black Dog. Billy Mansfield said that the Little Black Dog followed him wherever he went. But he was the only one who saw it. So people thought he was kind of crazy. To drive the dog away, Billy was always hollering at it, throwing rocks at it. But the dog always came back. The first time Billy saw that dog was the first day he fought Celis Burton. Billy was just a young man then, but the Burtons and Billy's family had been feuding for years. When Billy saw Silas riding towards him, he went for his gun, and Burton went for his. But Billy fired first. He hit Burton in the back, knocking him from his horse. Burton's horse ran off, and his gun fell where he couldn't reach it. He lay there on the ground, bleeding with Billy, not to kill him. But Billy killed him anyways. Burton's little black dog was with him when he shot. The dog kept licking Burton's face and barking and snarling at Billy in his anger. Billy killed the dog, too. I don't like Billy. There wasn't much law enforcement in those days, so Billy wasn't arrested. But all that night, he heard Burton's dog outside his cabin, scratching on his door and barking to be let in. I'm imagining this, Billy said. I shot that dog. It's dead. But the next morning, Billy saw the dog. It was waiting for him outside. From then on, there was not a day when he didn't see it. And there wasn't a night when he didn't hear it scratching on his door, barking to be let in. From then on, Billy was always finding black dog hairs on the sofa on the floor, in his bed, even in his food. And the house and the yard stink of the dog. That's what Billy said. Whenever somebody told him there wasn't any dog to see, he'd say, maybe you don't see it, but I do. And I'm not crazier than you are. Things went on like that for many years. Then one morning in the middle of winter, the neighbors didn't see any smoke coming out of Billy's chimney. When they went over to check, Billy wasn't there. A day or so later, they found his body lying in the snow in a field back of his cabin. Billy had plenty of enemies, and at first it seemed like somebody might have killed him, but there wasn't a mark on his body, and there weren't any footprints out there except for Billy's. The doctor said Billy probably died of old age. But there was something odd about his death. When the neighbors found Billy, there were black dog hairs on his clothes. There were even a few on his face. It smelled like a dog when he, they were out there. Yet, no one had seen a dog anywhere. Spooky doggy. This next story is called Clinky Clink. It's like an ASMR sound. Clinkity clinkity clink clink clink. Clinkity 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 clink. I got carried away with that one. I'm gonna take a, a quick sip of my strawberry lemonade before we get started. I hope you guys are enjoying hanging out with me for a bit. 
I played Beat Saber last night. My arms are super sore. Clinkity clink. An old lady got sick and died. She had no family and no friends. So the neighbors got a grave digger to dig a grave for her. And they had a coffin made and they placed her in her living room. As, she, as was the tradition, they washed her body and dressed her up in her best clothes and put her in the coffin. When she died, her eyes were wide open, staring at everything and seeing nothing. The neighbors found two silver dollars on her dresser and they put them on her eyelids to keep them closed. They lit candles and sat up with her so that she would not be too lonely on that first night that she was dead. The next morning, a preacher came and said a prayer for her. Then everybody went home. Later, the gravedigger arrived to take her to the cemetery and bury her. He stared at the silver dollars on her eyes and picked them up. How shiny and smooth they were. How thick and heavy. They're beautiful, he thought. Just beautiful. He looked at the dead woman with her eyes wide open and felt like she was staring at him. Watching him hold her coins, it gave him a creepy feeling. He put the coins back on those eyes of hers to keep them closed. But before he knew it, his hands reached out and grabbed the coins and stuck them in his pocket. Then he grabbed a hammer and quickly nailed shut the lid on the coffin. Now you can't see anything, he said to her. Then he took her out to the cemetery and he buried her as fast as he could. When the grave digger got home, he put the two silver dollars in a tin box and shook it. The coins made a cheerful rattling sound, but the grave digger wasn't feeling cheerful. He couldn't forget those eyes looking at him. When it got dark, a storm came up and the wind started blowing. They blew all around the house. It came through the cracks and around the windows and down the chimney. Buzzo! It went. Busy, busy, buzzo! The fire flared and flickered. The grave digger threw some fresh wood on the fire, got into bed, and pulled the blankets up to his chin. The wind kept blowing. Bazoo! It went busy, busy, bazoo! The fire flared and flickered and cast an evil looking shadow on the walls. The grave digger lay there, thinking about the dead woman's eyes staring at him. fire flared and flickered and popped and snapped and he got more and more scared suddenly he heard another sound clinkity clink clinkity clink clinkity clink it went clinkity clink it was the silver dollars rattling in the tin box hey the grave digger shouted who's taking my money was the wind blowing a busy, busy buzzo, and the flames flaring and flickering and snapping and popping, and the coins going clickety-clink, clickety-clink. He leaped out of bed and chained up the door. Then he hurried back, but his head had barely touched the pillow when he heard something way off in the distance. It was a voice crying, Where's my money? Who's got my money? Who? Who? And the wind blew yet again. Busy, busy, buzzo. And the fire flattered, and the fire flickered, and snapped and popped and the money went clinkity clink, clinkity clink. The grave digger was really scared. He got out of bed again and piled all the furniture against the door. And he put a heavy iron 
skillet over the tin box. He then jumped back into the bed and covered his head with the blankets, but the money rattled even louder than ever, and way off a voice cried, Give me my money. says here to quickly jump at someone and say you've got it uh but since you're not here i just went rap so that story was weird don't steal money from dead people that is not a good idea <laughs> we are now on to the second chapter of uh the book it's called she was spitting and howling just like a cat the tales in this chapter are about an empty trunk, a neighbor who turns into a cat, a strange drum, some very tasty sausages, and other scary things. This artwork is insane. The first story in this chapter is called The Bride. The minister's daughter had just gotten married. After the wedding ceremony, there was a great feast, with music and dancing and contests and games, even old children's games. When they got playing hide-and-seek, the bride decided to hide in her grandfather's trunk up in the attic. They'll never find me here, she thought. As she was climbing into the trunk, the lid came down and cracked on her head and she fell unconscious. The lid slammed shut and locked. No one will ever know how long she called for help or how hard she struggled to free herself from that tomb. Everyone in the village searched for her and they looked almost everywhere, but no one thought to look inside the trunk. After a week, her brand new bride uh, groom and all the others gave up for her lost. Years later, a maid went up to the attic looking for something she needed. Maybe it's in the trunk, she thought. She opened it and screamed. There lay the missing bride in her wedding dress, but by then, she was only a skeleton. So, that's what the bride looked like in the trunk. I would say if I ever came across that um, in an attic, I would uh, would set the entire house on fire. Don't do that. Don't ever do that. I don't condone that. The next story is called Rings on Her Fingers. Day 
Daisy Clark had been in a coma for more than a month when the doctor said that she had finally died. She was buried on a cool summer day in a small cemetery about a mile from her home. May she always rest in such peace, her husband said. But she didn't. Late that night, a grave robber with a shovel and a lantern began to dig her up. Since the ground was still soft, he quickly reached the coffin and it got open. His hunch was right. Daisy had been buried wearing two valuable rings. A wedding ring with a diamond in it and a ring with a ruby that glowed as if it were alive. The thief got down on his knees and reached into the coffin to get the rings, but they were stuck fast on her fingers, so he decided that the only way to get them was to cut off her fingers with a knife. But then, I mean, but when he cut into her finger with the wedding ring, she began to bleed, and Daisy Clark began to stir. Suddenly, she sat up, terrified. The thief scrambled to his feet. He accidentally kicked over the lantern, and the light went out. He could hear Daisy climb out of her grave as she moved past him in the dark. He stood frozen with fear, clutching the knife in his hand. When Daisy saw him, she pulled her shroud around her and asked, Who are you? When the grave robber heard this corpse speak, he ran. Daisy shrugged her shoulders and walked on, and never once looked back. But in his fear and confusion, the thief fled in the wrong direction. He pitched headlong into her grave, fell on the knife, and stabbed himself. While Daisy walked home, the thief bled to death. What? They did the old switcheroo. See, I would, I never understand grave robbers. I mean, it's bad enough to rob someone that's living like thieves. You're terrible. I hate you. But like to rob a dead person, that's insane. The next story is called The Drum. Once there were two sisters. Dolores was seven and Sandra was five. They lived in a small house in the country with their mother and their baby brother, Arthur. Their father was a seaman and was away on a long voyage. One day, Dolores and Sandra were running across a field near their house when they met a gypsy girl playing a drum. Her family was camping in the field for a few days as the girl played. A little mechanical man and woman came out of the drum and danced. Dolores and Sandra had never seen such a drum, and they begged the girl to give it to them. She looked at them and laughed. I will give it to you, she said, but only if you're really bad. Come back tomorrow and tell me how bad you were, and I will see. As soon as the two sisters got home, they started shouting, which was against the rules in their house. Then they rode all over the walls with their crayons. At supper, they spilled their food, and when it was time for bed, they wouldn't go. They did everything they could to, they could think of to upset their mother. They were really bad. Early next morning, they hurried off to find the gypsy girl. Uh, we were really bad yesterday, they told her, so please give us the drum. But when they told her what they had done, the gypsy girl laughed. <laughs> oh, you must be much worse than that if I am to give you this drum, she said. As soon as, the Dol as, soon as Dolores and Sandra got home, they pulled up all the flowers in the garden. They let the pig out and it chased away. They tore their clothes. They sloshed in the mud. They were a lot worse than the day before. If you don't stop, their mother said, I will go away and take Arthur with me, and he will get a new mother with glass eyes and a wooden tail. That 
that scared Dolores and Sandra. They loved their mother, and they loved Arthur. They could not imagine being without them, and they began to cry. <sighs> I don't want to leave you, their mother said, but unless you change your behavior, I will have to leave you. We'll be good, the girls promised. Yet, they did not really believe that their mother would go away. She's just trying to scare us, Dolores said later. We'll get the drum tomorrow, said Sandra. Then we'll be good again. Early next morning, they rushed off to find the gypsy girl. When they found her, she was playing the drum again, and the little man and woman were dancing. They told the gypsy how bad they had been the day before. That must be bad enough to get the drum, they said. Oh, no, said the gypsy girl. You must be much worse than that. But we promised our mother to be good from now on, said the girl. If you really want the drum, said the gypsy girl, you must be much, much worse. It's only for one more day, Dolores told Sandra. Then we'll have that drum. I hope you're right, said Sandra. As soon as they got home, they beat the dog with a stick. They broke the dishes. They tore their clothes to pieces. They spanked their baby brother, Arthur. Their mother began to cry. You are not keeping your promise, she said. We will be good, said Dolores. We promise, said Sandra. I can't wait much longer, said the mother. Please try. This is the saddest story ever. Early the next morning, before their mother was awake, Dolores and Sandra ran to see the gypsy girl. They told her all about the bad things they had done the day before. We were horrid, said Sandra. We were worse than we've ever been, said Dolores. Can we have the drum now, please? No, said the gypsy girl. I never meant to give it to you. It was just a game we were playing. I thought you knew that. Dolores and Sandra began to cry. They rushed home as quickly as they could, but their mother and Arthur were gone. They're out shopping, said Dolores. They'll be back soon. But they were still not back when it's time for when time for lunch came. This is uh, a cool forest that accompanies this story. But they were still not back when time for lunch came. Dolores and Sandra felt lonely and scared. They wandered through the fields for the rest of the day. Maybe they will be home when we get back, said Dolores. When they got home, they saw through the window that the lamps were lit, and there was a fire in the fireplace, but they did not see their mother and Arthur. Instead, there was a new mother, her glass eyes glistening, and her wooden tail thumping on the floor. Wow. If you're willing to be that bad for a drum, like, I'm sorry, you're, you're awful. Our next story has a creepy man in the in the clouds with a full moon, and it's called The Window. Margaret and her brothers, Paul and David, shared a small house on top of a hill just outside the village. It was so warm one summer's night that Margaret could not sleep. She sat up in bed in the darkness of her room watching the moon move across the sky. Suddenly, something caught her eye. She saw two small yellow-green lights moving through the woods near the graveyard at the bottom of the hill. They looked like the eyes of some animal, but she could not make out what kind of creature it was. Soon, the creature left the woods and moved up, to, moved up the hill toward the house. For a few minutes, Margaret lost sight of it, then she saw it coming across the lawn toward her window. It looked something like a man, and yet it didn't. Margaret 
was terrified. She wanted to run from her room, but the door was next to her window. She was afraid the creature would see her and break in before she could escape. When the creature turned and moved into another direction, Margaret rushed the door. But before she could open the door, it was back. Margaret found herself staring through the window at a shrunken face like it was of a mummy. Its yellow-green eyes gleamed like a cat's eyes. She wanted to scream, but she was so frightened that she couldn't make a sound. The creature broke the window glass, unlocked the window, and crawled inside. Margaret tried to flee, but the creature caught her. It twisted its long, bony fingers into her hair and pulled back her head, and it sank its teeth into her throat. Margaret screamed and fainted. When her brothers heard a piercing scream, they rushed to her room. But by the time they got there, the door unlocked. The creature had fled, and Margaret lay on the floor bleeding, unconscious. While Paul tried to stop the bleeding, David chased the creature down the hill toward the graveyard, but soon he lost sight of it. The police thought it was a work of an escaped lunatic who believed he was a vampire. When Margaret recovered, her brothers wanted to move to a safer place where it would be harder to break in, but Margaret refused. The creature would never come back. She was sure of that, but just in case, Paul and David began to keep loaded pistols in their rooms. One night, months later, Margaret was awakened by a scratching sound at the window. When she opened her eyes, there was the same shrunken face staring in at her. That night, her brothers heard cries this time. They chased the creature down the hill, and David shot it in the leg but the creature managed to scramble over the graveyard wall and disappeared near an old burial vault. The next day, Margaret and her brothers watched as the sexton of the church opened the burial vault. Inside was a horrifying scene. Broken coffins, bones, and rotting flesh were scattered all over the floor. Only one coffin had been disturbed. When the sexton opened it, there lay the creature with the shrunken face that attacked Margaret. The telltale bullet was in its leg. They did the only thing they knew to get rid of them. The sexton built a war roaring blaze outside the vault and fed the shrunken body to the flames. They watched the body burn until nothing remained but ashes. This next one is called Wonderful Sausage, and it has a really cool illustration to go along with it. <laughs> Looks pretty creepy already. One dark, rainy Saturday afternoon, a fat and jolly butcher named Samuel Blunt had an argument over money with his wife, Eloise. Blunt lost his temper and killed. Eloise. Then he ground her up into sausage meat and buried her bones under a big flat rock into the backyard. To keep the murder a secret, he told everyone that she had moved away. Blunt mixed his new sausage meat with the pork, then seasoned it with salt and pepper, added some sage and thyme and a bit of garlic. To give it a special flavor, he smoked it in his smokehouse for a while. He called it Blunt's Special Sausage. There is such a demand for his new sausage that Blunt bought the best hogs he could find and started raising his own pork. He also kept a sharp lookout for humans who might make tasty sausage meat. One day, a nice plump school teacher came into his shop. Blunt grabbed her and ground her up. Another time, Blunt's dentist came by. He was a little round man, and into the grinder he went. Then one by one, the children in the neighborhood began to disappear, and so did their kittens and puppies. But no one ever dreamed that Blunt the butcher had anything to do with it. Things went on that 
that way for years. Then one day, Blunt made a big mistake. A fat boy came into the butcher shop. Blunt grabbed him and started to drag him off into the sausage grinder. But the boy broke loose and ran out of the shop. And Blunt chased after him, waving a big butcher knife. When people saw this, they realized at once what had become of all the missing children and grown-ups and kittens and puppies. An angry crowd gathered at the butcher shop. No one knows for sure just what happened to Blunt that day. Some say he was fed to his hogs. Others say he was fed to his sausage grinder. But he was never seen again. And neither was his wonderful sausage meat. That one's pretty pretty scary, I guess. <laughs> Next story is Cat's Paw. The Cat's Paw. It's a pretty cool looking uh, illustration there. Somebody was stealing the meat Jed Smith kept in his smokehouse every day. A ham or some bacon or something else was missing. Finally, Jed decided he had to put a stop to it. One night, he hid in the smokehouse with his rifle and waited for the thief. He didn't have to wait long, for soon a black she-cat slunk in. She was the biggest cat Jed had ever seen. When she jumped up and pulled a ham hanging from the ceiling, Jed grabbed his rifle and turned on the lights. But instead of running away, the cat jumped at him. He fired and shot off one of her paws. Jed was sure he heard a woman scream right after the gun went off. The cat began tearing around the room, spitting and yowling. Then she ran up the chimney and was gone. Jed stared at the cat's paw. Only, it wasn't a cat's paw anymore. It was a woman's foot lay riling on the floor, all shot up and bloody. So it's a witch that's been doing it, he told himself. Just then, one of Jed's neighbors, a fellow named Burdick, came racing down the road to get a doctor. His wife's foot had been shot in an accident, he told Jed. She's bleeding pretty bad, he said. The doctor got to her barely in time. People who were there when it happened said it was said that she was spitting and yowling just like a cat. So his neighbor's wife was stealing all the stuff. That's scary. This next story is called The Voice. Ellen had fallen asleep when she heard a strange voice. Ellen, it whispered, I'm coming up the stairs. I'm on the first step. Now I'm on the second step. Ellen got scared and called her parents, but they didn't hear her and they didn't come. Then the voice whispered, Ellen, I'm on the top step. Now I'm in your hall. Now I'm outside your room. Then it whispered, I'm standing right next to your bed. And then, I've got you. Ellen screamed and the voice stopped. Her father rushed into the room and turned on the light. Somebody's in here. Ellen said. They looked and looked, and nobody was there. That's pretty scary. It looks like we have two more chapters. This next chapter is called When I Wake Up, Everything Will Be Alright. There are scary stories here about a subway car, a shopping mall, and other dangerous places. Jesus. <laughs> 
This first one's called Oh Susanna. And there is the uh, illustration. myself a little bit of a yawn there. These always used to put me to sleep, and I'd have nightmares about them. Susanna and Jane shared a small apartment near the university where they were students. When Susanna got back from the library one night, the lights were out and Jane was asleep. Susanna undressed in the dark and quietly got into bed. She had almost fallen asleep when she heard someone humming the tune to a song. Oh, Susanna. Jane, she said, please stop humming. I want to get some sleep. Jane didn't answer, but the humming stopped. And Susanna fell asleep. She awakened early the next morning, too. Too early, really. She decided, and it was and was trying to go back to sleep when she heard the humming again. Ah, please go back to sleep, she told Jane. It's too early to get up. Jane didn't answer, but the humming continued, and Susanna became angry. Cut it out, she said. It's not funny. When the humming still did not stop, she lost her temper. She jumped out of bed, pulled the covers off, and screamed. Jane's head was gone. Somebody had cut off her head. I'm, I'm having a nightmare, Susanna told herself. When I wake up, everything will be all right. And that's the end of the story. That's the end of that. That is terrifying. Imagine seeing that Jesus this next story is called The Man in the Middle. The Man in the Middle. It was almost midnight. Sally Druid had just gotten on the subway train at 50th Street after visiting her mother. Don't worry, Sally had told her. The subway is safe. There's always a policeman on duty. But that night she didn't see one. Except for her. The subway car was empty. At 42nd Street, three looking, tough looking men got on. Two of them were holding up the third, who looked drunk. His head rolled from side to side, and his legs refused to work. When they got him seated between them, his head came to rest on one of his shoulders. Sally thought he was staring at her. She buried her head in a book and tried not to notice. At 28th Street, one of the men stood up. Take it easy, Jim, he said to the man in the middle, and he got off. At 23rd Street, Jim's other friend stood up. You'll be fine, he said, and he got off. Now the only ones left in the car were Jim and Sally. Just then, the train went around a sharp curve and Jim pitched onto the floor at Sally's feet. When she looked down at him, she saw a trickle of blood on the side of his head, and just above it, a bullet hole. They were carrying around a dead body. That's scary. This next one is the cat in a shopping bag. Spooky. Mrs. Briggs was driving to the shopping mall to do some last-minute Christmas shopping when she accidentally ran over a cat. She could not bear to leave the corpse on the road for the other cars to hit and squash, so she stopped, wrapped the cat up in some tissue paper she had with her, and put it in an old shopping bag in the back of her seat. She would bury it in the backyard when she got home. At the mall, she parked her car and began walking to one of the stores. She had taken only a few steps out. When out of the corner of her eye, she saw a woman reach into the open window of her car and take the shopping bag with the dead cat. Then the woman quickly got in a car nearby and drove away. Mrs.
Mrs. Briggs ran back to her car and followed the woman. She had caught up with her at the diner down the road. She followed her inside and watched the woman slide into a booth and give the waitress her order. As the woman sat sipping her soda, she reached into Mrs. Briggs' shopping bag. Then she bent down and looked inside. A look of horror crossed her face. She screamed and fainted. The waitress called an ambulance. Two attendants carried the woman away on a stretcher, but they left the shopping bag behind. Mrs. Briggs picked up the bag and ran after them. This is her, she called. It's her Christmas present. She wouldn't want to lose it. Mrs. Briggs is an asshole. <laughs> This next story is The Bed by the Window. The three old men who shared a room at the nursing home, their room only had one window. But for them, it was the only link to the real world. Ted Conklin, who had been there the longest, had the bed next to the window. When Ted, when Ted died, the man in the bed. <laughs> when Ted died, the man in the next bed, George Best, took his place. And the third man, Richard Green, took George's bed. Despite his illnesses, George's was a cheerful man who spent his days describing the sights he could see from his bed. Pretty girls, a policeman on horseback, a traffic jam, a pizza parlor, a fire station, and other scenes of life outside. Richard loved to listen to George, but the more George talked about life outside, the more Richard wanted to see it for himself. Yet, he knew that only when George died would he have his chance. He wanted to look out the window so badly that one day he decided to kill George. He is going to die soon anyways, he told himself. What difference would it make? George had a bad heart. If he had a heart attack during the night and a nurse could not get to him right away, he had pills he could take. He kept them in a bottle on the top of his cabinet between his bed and Richard's. All Richard had to do was knock the bottle to the floor when George could not reach it. A few nights later, George died, just as Richard had planned he would. And the next morning, Richard moved to the bed by the window. Now he would see for himself all the things that George had described. After the nurses had left, Richard turned to the window and looked out. But all he could see was a blank brick wall. It was just a brick wall. Dude, you just murdered someone for nothing. This next one's called The Dead Man's Hand. Staring at the dead man's hand and mumbling to herself, Alice didn't even look up. I'm an idiot. I just started on the second page. Ignore that. The students at the school for nurses got along quite well with one another, except for Alice. The trouble with Alice was that she was perfect. At least that's how it seemed to the other students. She was always friendly and always cheerful. Nothing ever upset her. Her school assignments were always on time and always perfect. She didn't even bite her fingernails. Many of the student nurses resented Alice. They would have liked to see her fail at something, become frightened, or cry, or do something that shows she had a weakness like they did. One night, several students tried to frighten Alice with a practical joke. They borrowed the hand of a corpse they had been studying in anatomy and tied it to a light cord in her closet. When she tried to turn on the light, she would find herself holding a dead man's hand, and that would scare anybody. One of them said, if it doesn't scare her, nothing will. After tying the hand in place, they went to the movies. When they got back, 
Alice was asleep, but when they didn't see her the next morning, they decided to find out what happened. There was no sign of Alice in her room, but they soon found her. She was sitting on the floor in her closet, staring at the dead man's hand, mumbling to herself. Alice didn't even look up. The joke had worked, but nobody was laughing. That's just a story of mean people being mean. This next story is called A Ghost in the Mirror. This is a scary game that young people sometimes play trying to conjure up ghosts in their bathroom mirror. Many don't really believe that a ghost is going to appear, but they try to raise one anyway. For the fun of the excitement, some are willing to settle for a ghost, but others have a particular ghost in mind. One of these is a ghost named Mary Worth, who is also known as Mary Jane and Bloody Mary. She is the heroine of an old comic strip, but some would say she actually was a witch who was hanged at the infamous witch trials in Salem, Massachusetts in 1692. Another of these ghosts is La Llorona, the weeping woman who wanders the streets and cities from Texas to California and throughout Mexico looking for her lost child. Still another is Mary Wales, a one, a young woman who is supposed to have been killed in a car accident in Indianapolis, Indiana about 1965. Her ghost is one of the vanishing hitchhikers. It is said again and again, she thumbs a ride home in a passing car, then vanishes before she gets there. Here's how ghost hunters try to raise a ghost. Number one, they find a quiet bathroom, close the door, and turn off the lights. While they stare at the face in the mirror, they repeat the ghost's name, usually 47 times, or a hundred times. If any ghost will do, they say any ghost in the place of a name. If they do manage to raise one, its face will slowly replace their face in the mirror. Some say a ghost is likely to be angry at being disrespected. If it gets angry enough, they say it will try to shatter the mirror and come right into the room. But a player can always turn on the lights and send the ghost back to where it came from. And when that happens, the game is over. I guess that just teaches you how to play Bloody Mary and stuff like that. Uh, the last chapter is about funny stories, too. I can't wait for that one. This next one is called The Curse. My dad's friend, Charlie Porter, was a small, nervous man who's always looking around as if he was in some kind of danger. After he told me this story about his college fraternity, I understood why. The frat doesn't exist anymore, he said. It was banned years ago, but we had just nine members at the point, at that point, and we're talking. We had just nine members at that point, and we're taking in two more, Jack Lawden and Ernie Kramer. One night in January, just about this time of year, the nine of us took them out to the country for their initiation. We took them to an old deserted house, where two young men about our age had been murdered recently. Their murderer was still at large. We gave Jack a lighted candle and told him to go up to the third floor and stay there for an hour. We told him, then come back down. Don't speak. Don't make any noise. If your candle goes out, carry on in the dark. From where we were standing, we could see the light from Jack's candle up the stairs to the second floor, then to the third. But when he got to the third floor, his candle went out. We guessed that he had come to a drafty corner, and the wind blew it out. 
when the hour went by and he didn't come down, we weren't so sure. We waited another 15 minutes and got more and more nervous. So we sent Ernie Kramer up far after him. When Ernie got to the third floor, his candle also went out. We waited 10 minutes, 20 minutes, but there was no sign of either of them. Come on down, we called, but they didn't answer. Finally, we decided to go and get them. Armed with flashlights, we started up the stairs. It was quiet and dark as a grave in that house. When we got to the second floor, we called out again, but there was no answer. When we got to the third floor, we walked into a great big open space like an attic. Jack and Ernie weren't there. We saw footprints in the dust. These led to the room on the other side of the attic. The room was also empty, but there was fresh blood on the floor, and the window was wide open. It was about 25 feet to the ground, but there was no ladder or rope in sight they could have used to get down. We searched the rest of the house and the land around the house and found nothing. We decided that they were playing a trick on us. We figured out in some way they had escaped through the window and were hiding in the woods. The blood on the floor was to throw us off the track. We guessed that they'd show up the next day with a lot of stories and a lot of laughs, but they didn't. The next day we told the Dean of Men that what had happened and he reported it to the police. The police didn't find anything either and after several weeks the search ended. To this day, no one knows what happened to Jack Lawton and Ernie Kramer. There isn't much more to tell, he said. They weren't arrested, but the college disbanded the fraternity and suspended the nine of us from school for a year. The strangest part came after we graduated. Someone must have placed a curse on us. Every year since then, around the time of that initiation, one of us has died or gone crazy. I'm the only one left, he said, and I'm in pretty good health, but there are times when I just feel a little particular. <clears throat> it said he dies. He dies. So they were cursed, and he died. <laughs> the last chapter is called The Last Laugh. These scary stories are scary and funny. Two of my favorite things, comedy and horror. The first one is called The Church. There was a fellow named Larry Berger who wasn't afraid of anybody alive, but anybody who was dead scared the wits out of him. One night, Larry was out driving in the country in his old Jeep when he got caught in a bad thunderstorm. The rain was coming down the sheets since his jeep didn't have a top to it. Larry started looking for a place to take shelter, but at the first place he came to, he didn't even slow down. It was an old deserted cabin, probably as dry as bone inside, but Larry knew for a fact that it was haunted and he was going to stay there. A few miles farther, he came to an old abandoned church standing alone in a field. It hadn't been used in years. All the windows, glass was gone, but it still had sections of the roof intact. So Larry parked his Jeep and ran inside. It was dark as could be in there. Larry groped around until he found a pew and sat down. It was nice and dry, just as he thought it would be. And he stretched out his legs and made himself comfortable. Suddenly, there was a big flash of lightning and Larry saw that he wasn't the only one in that church. There were people sitting in almost every pew. They all had their heads bowed as if they were praying, and they all were dressed in white. These must be ghosts sitting in their shrouds, Larry thought. They must have come in from some graveyard to get dry. Larry jumped up and ran down the aisle as fast as he could, right smack into one of the ghosts. And the ghost went bad. It was a sheep. 
This next story is called The Bad News. Leon and Todd loved baseball. When they were young, they had played on the town's baseball team. Leon had been the pitcher, and Todd played second base. Now that they were a lot older, they spent their free time watching baseball games on TV and talking about baseball. Do you think they play baseball in heaven? Leon asked Todd one day. That's a good question, said Todd. The one who gets there first should let the other one know somehow. As it turned out, Todd got to heaven first, and Leon waited patiently to hear from him. One day, Leon found Todd sitting in the living room waiting for him. Leon was very excited to see him. What's it like up there? he asked. And what about baseball? When it comes to baseball, said Todd. I have some good news, and I have some bad news. The good news is, is that we do play baseball in heaven. We have some fine teams. I play second base on my team, just like I used to in the old days. That's the good news. What's the bad news? asked Leon. <sighs> the bad news, said Todd, is that you're scheduled to pitch tomorrow. Dude. Okay, I got some gooseys on that one. This next story is called The Brown Suit. A woman came to the funeral parlor to see her husband's corpse. You did a good job, she said to the undertaker. He looks just the way he looked, except for one thing. My husband's always worn a brown suit, but you dressed him in a blue suit. That is no problem, said the undertaker. We can easily change it. When she returned later, her husband was wearing a brown suit. Now he looks just the way he always did, she said. I know you went to a lot of trouble. It was no trouble, he said. As it happened, there is a man here who was wearing a brown suit, and his widow felt that blue would be better. He is about your husband's size, so he gave him the blue one and gave your husband the brown one. Even so, she said, changing all that clothing was a big job. Not really, said the undertaker. All we did was exchange their heads. That's, I like that one. That's trippy. All right. Our final story of the night is Thumpity Thump. before 
first shovel struck something hard. Pretty soon we could see the edge of a box sticking out. We all hollered for him to hurry up and uncover the rest of it. And the chair got so excited it jumped up and down like I had gone plumb crazy. When I got the box uncovered, Bob and the boys pried off the lid and there was the body of a man all smooched in blood. It was plain as the nose on your face that he had been murdered. And the chair wanted folks to know it. Right then and there we decided to leave. Being strangers, everybody would think that we had murdered him and come there to hide the body. It didn't take us long to fill up that hole and get out of that house. The chair was awful mad about your leaving and it went up the cellar stairs. Thumpity thump, thumpity thump, louder than it had gone down. Then it thumpity thump, thumpity thump. The next set of stairs, and next louder still, when it got back to the attic, thumpity thumped so loud, we thought it would thump all the plaster and down our heads. Nobody asked us why we were moving out so soon, because nobody ever stayed more than one night in that place and most not that long. But I can tell you we were thankful to get back to show Sherry. Where chairs stay where they're put and don't go roaring and rampaging round scaring folks out of their wits, putting out murders and goodness knows that. Good night, everybody. Don't forget to smile.